the key to unlocking optimal health, the life course paradigm. My name is Jonathan Christensen. I'm an Auckland-based cardiologist and the immediate past New Zealand president of the college. I will be introducing our invited guest speakers individually throughout the session, but I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Susan Morton, Sir Mason Dury, Dr. Ashley Bloomfield, and Ms. Karen Brown. Just before I carry on, I've been asked to remind everybody that there are concurrent sessions, and there was a little confusion about the Ramanzini sessions. They are starting now and not after lunch. So if anybody would like to leave for those, this is your opportunity. Thank you. As clinicians, our day-to-day -day interactions with patients are founded on their stories, their narratives of personal journeys, their whanau experiences, and their lifelong perceptions of health and the impairment of it. And so I thought I would begin this short introduction with a story of my own. I saw Leilani and her whanau again in clinic last week. Leilani is 23, and I have been her cardiologist since she was 15. She is always beautifully, naively upbeat for someone who is dying. Her severe rheumatic valvular cardiomyopathy is entering its final stages. The National Transplant Service have declined to offer her a chance of a new heart. There are just too many complications. There was clinically little to do at the visit. I tweaked her furosemide dose, nothing more. But I listened as Leilani brought me up to date with her news. She is planning her wedding, she says. She conjures up a vision of her dreams, expounding on the dress, the flowers, the location for the ceremony. Leilani's partner holds her hand and nods her agreement. For a moment, it all seems possible. Reality is suspended. But their plans are for two years' time, too distant. And there's no money. Leilani's mum is downcast. She confesses she raided Leilani's wedding savings. It used to be that mum would buy alcohol, but it may be pee now. I choose not to ask. Leilani has known for many years that she won't have a family of her own, so she cares as a mother for her youngest brother, now aged three. That was a memorable clinic visit in 2016 when Leilani told me she had named this bonny newborn boy Diltiazum. I just really liked the sound of it, she said. So many years on that drug for rate control of her atrial fibrillation. Leilani's childhood rheumatic fever came while she was being moved from foster home to foster home under social work care and Oranga Tamariki protocols. Her parents were alcoholic, unemployed, her father abusive, her sister has fetal alcohol syndrome and her twin brother died of pneumonia at only seven months old. Her family home was squalid. Leilani left school at 11 with no qualifications. She gave up on her desire to be a flight attendant shortly after I first met her. A failed suicide attempt cast a shadow over her 15th birthday. The crowded, cold and damp house she and her partner now share with her brother, mother and other whanau is traumatic and Leilani struggles to maintain compliance with her complex regimen of cardiac medications. We wrapped up the clinic review and Leilani optimistically looked forward to our next follow-up visit and another update of her wedding plans. At such visits, I glimpse what Sir William Osler identified when once asked why he was whistling a jaunty tune on leaving the bedside of a gravely ill patient. His response, I whistle so that I may not weep. Leilani's story is not unusual. As clinicians, we can grow to be inured to such grinding poverty, the breakdown of whānau structure, the persistent inequity of care and outcomes. In New Zealand and Australia, such inequity has too often become normalised and accepted. The scale of the problems we see daily as doctors can seem overwhelming and beyond our individual influence. We are paralysed by the enormity of them. And in such inaction, we risk becoming those faceless citizens in Hans Magnus Enzenberger's poem, Song for Those Who Know. Its opening stanza reads, something must be done right away. That much we know. But of course, it's too soon to act. But of course, it's too late in the day. Oh, we know. Perhaps in struggling to grasp such patient stories, we retreat to safety, to what we know and can exert a modicum of personal control over. 
the technical aspects, changing medications, performing interventions, testing novel therapies, completing research protocols. We withdraw into our jargon and our data and limit our actions to a narrow specialist field. I know that I have done that too often when faced with such tragedy and social complexity. But such stories and connections should prompt all of us to take a wider view, to look up from the purely scientific and technical and act now, individually and collectively, not just in our clinics but as advocates in wider society. I have personally been inspired by luminaries such as Sir Harry Burns and Sir Michael Marmot, and I firmly believe that with enough energy and focus, doctors, us, we can change the world. One of our college's passionate trainee leaders, Dr. Jin Russell, reminded us last year that doctors are ideally positioned to advocate for societal change. We have the privilege of hearing people's stories firsthand. We are an eyewitness to their suffering. We are trained to interpret data and to contribute to scientific research. And we have pledged to live according to a shared ethic of care and concern for others rather than self. We should all commit to positively influencing health and social policies and to relentlessly highlighting that unresolved stark social inequities will inevitably lead to the persistent of inequity in health outcome. It was my privilege to lead our New Zealand College's advocacy campaign, Make It the Norm, in 2017. I would like to acknowledge Harriet Wilde, who created the artwork that you saw coming in today that formed the basis of that campaign. Many of our members told me they were proud our college was so publicly calling for immediate, specific and tangible actions in the key areas of healthy housing, whānau well-being and the health benefits of good work. Our college can make a real difference when we stand united and lead through our strength and diversity of specialist expertise. I hope that this session will have these key themes underpinning the expert presentations and discussion and that each of you will be inspired to remember what a huge difference we can make to the lives of our patients. It is my hope too that this session will leave you empowered to advocate for change, to appeal for the promotion of well-being and equity of health outcomes for the benefit of all. Thank you. I'd now like to invite uh, our first speaker, Professor Susan Morton, to the stage. Uh, Professor Morton is an expert in life course epidemiology and a specialist in public health medicine. She's the director of the University of Auckland's Cross Faculty Centre for Longitudinal Research, He Ara Kimua, and has been the primary investigator and director of the contemporary longitudinal study of New Zealand children's and families, known as Growing Up in New Zealand, since its inception in 2005. And that study is following more than 6,000 children in the context of their families in the New Zealand environment. Necessarily, her team engages across 16 government agencies to provide evidence to inform cross-sectoral policies to improve population well-being and solutions to reduce inequities in life course outcomes. Professor Morton, thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Taranaki te maunga, ko Waiwakaio te awa, ko Ngāti Pākehā toko iwi, no Namutu aho, ko Susan Morton toko ingoa, no reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. So. I come with my own journey, um, and I hope to share a little of that with you today. I feel very privileged to be here standing in front of you and surrounded by such a group of eminent physicians and people I've known for many decades. I think uh, the life course paradigm is something that I have been intimately involved with for several decades, and I hope that I can share what that has meant for me and hopefully inspire some of you to think about what it might mean for you if you've thought about it before, then hopefully inspire you further. If you haven't, then hopefully get you to think about it from a different perspective. So I just wanted to start with this rather unusual diagram of a life course approach so that we're on the same page when we start thinking about what a life course paradigm means. 
And I think it's easy sometimes to think that a life course is a life span. And sometimes when we think about the privilege of having someone in front of us in a clinic situation, we often see them in that time of vulnerability. We see them in that moment. And yet they come to us with a past and they leave us to head into a future, whatever that future might be. And the way that they have come to be in front of us has been very much influenced by their journey to date. And that journey has not been equitable for everybody who is impacted by the environments around them. And this life course approach is something that I encountered first in the United Kingdom when I was lucky enough to go there in the late 90s. And I really started to move beyond my pediatric background to think about some of the broader social determinants of health that we see above that red dotted line in that paradigm diagram. The idea that actually health is really shaped as much by social environments and by inequities as it is by biology. I guess one of the things that struck me when I came back to New Zealand around 15 years ago was that there seemed to be this dichotomy when we talked about life course. I came back full of this idea of life course epidemiology and what it was going to be for my future practice. And I encountered people who were neonatal uh, pediatricians and also those who were cardiovascular physicians. And there seemed to be this idea that the two couldn't coexist. And I guess what I saw my role as, as it, as it often was in the UK with others around me, is to say that this is a journey and that all parts of the life course matter. In fact, across generations matter too. And that was something that I had the privilege of bringing to a new longitudinal study, now called Growing Up in New Zealand. And really from the beginning in 2004, when just coming back from London, we had the opportunity to think about how would we design a new longitudinal study of New Zealand children that could actually address some of the frustrations, if you like, that our government agents, that our physicians, that our clinicians, that others in the community faced, seeing the constant inequities in our outcomes for our children, that we're not responding to some of the well-intentioned policies that were being developed to actually diminish them. So this study was born, really, by 16 government agencies saying we need to know about our current generation of children. And so one of the things we did from the beginning in leading the development of this new study was to say, well, if we're going to look at the development of children, we need to do it in a life course way. And so this double puddle model that you see on the screen was our conceptual framework for how we would think about measuring child development. And of course, health and well-being was central to that, but it wasn't the only thing that we were interested in. The children were at the center. If you like, they were the microscope. The microscope was on them, but there was a telescopic lens too, as we heard from Mason this morning. We were interested in how children's interaction with all of the environments around them over time brought them to particular outcomes at particular points in time. And so it was a dynamic interaction that we were interested in, not children as passive recipients of whatever was going on around them, but actually dynamically interacting with those environments all the way out to the policy environment. And the red arrow that you can see on both those diagrams was really an indication of what we were trying to solve with some of the evidence we would collect from the families who would be engaged in the study. This idea that despite the best of intentions at the policy level, they still were not necessarily achieving at an individual level the change that was intended. So sometimes the policies were not reaching the target audience, sometimes they were not having the impact that they were expected to have. So this red arrow was a mind the gap arrow. And a lot of what we've done in the study is to try and understand why that gap exists. And I guess not, why, not just why it exists, but what we can do about it. What can we do to close that gap? So just to give you a quick overview, and this is the only real slide about the cohort, we do have over 6,000 children in the cohort. They were recruited from before their birth because the first 1,000 days that you hear about this afternoon was already an area that was emerging in terms of DOHAD, FOAD, and now called the first 1,000 days. The importance of that early development for setting trajectories for children was well known. So we wanted to engage with mothers before they had their children so we could find out what that environment was going to be like before the children were even born. We also wanted to recruit the dads, because dads matter too, or the partners of the mum, if there was a partner around, and see them right from pregnancy onwards. Most importantly, I think, in this cohort study and in what we've found out of it so far, 
is that we have Māori and Pacifica children represented in sufficient numbers to be able to understand what shapes their development and actually what creates well-being, not just what creates poor outcomes. So our population of interest has always been current births. The cohort represents the current diversity of ethnicity and socioeconomic status of the families having children in New Zealand today, which is really important when we're trying to inform policy. Um, and we need to hold on and create relationships and partnerships with these children and their families to ensure that we keep hearing their voices over time. And the children are currently turning nine. So what I want to do in the last couple of minutes is really just to focus in on an example of how we've used life course frameworks to look at a particular problem that we know has impact for our health outcomes for our children, for creating inequities, and for pretty much any other outcome we can think about in the preschool period. So we have focused on poverty in the first thousand days before it was really a focus more generally with this government, but actually vulnerability has always been something we're interested in. Interested in as clinicians, but also uh, generally in terms of the population and how can we make a difference for our most vulnerable. And I guess one of the advantages of having a study that has looked at these multi-dimensions across time is that we can define poverty not by a single proxy, but by a clustering of things that go on for families. And we see in this cluster housing, for example, that we've heard about, quality of housing, tenure, stability of housing, as well as things like employment of parents, income that is available to families, ability to take leave, hardship that exists at the family level, as well as human capital. How do families get on? Are they supported in their communities? What are their relationships with each other like as parents and the rest of their family? And what are the relationships like with their children? So we think about poverty in this sort of multi-dimensional way. And using the information that we have from these 6,800 families, we've been able to look over the first 1,000 days in pregnancy, in the first year, in the second year, to look at clustering and accumulation of exposure to some of these variables that, on their own, measure disadvantage, but actually across a population, cluster in ways that are not necessarily uniform. And we've been able to look at children who are exposed to four or more of these factors at three time points in those first thousand days, or one to three, or none. And we've been able to compare what has happened to them in their preschool years. And here's an example of what we've found. When we look at those children who have experienced what we might call persistent poverty, we see on the top of that graphic there that those children who are constantly exposed to poverty with clustering of those factors there's almost one in two of them who are likely to be experiencing behavioural difficulties by the time they're four and a half, by the, before they go to school, compared to only 4% in the group who are not exposed to any. And we can also see that there's a gradient that exists here. So dose matters and duration matters. So these children are experiencing higher rates of behavioural issues. We'd expect around 10% in that abnormal range right across the population. And it doesn't matter what outcome we look at, it's comorbidity that happens for these children. So here's just an example of obesity, but equally we could have put literacy, or we could have put numeracy, or we could have put peer relationships, or we could have put admissions to hospital. We see the same picture, different magnitude, but the same graded impact. So we could have stopped there and said, well, yes, poverty is bad. And yes, we've demonstrated for this cohort that it's bad, but actually we wanted to do more than that. Because actually what we can do with the stories from these diverse children and their families is to say, yes, there is more likelihood that those who experience persistent vulnerability or poverty are going to experience or be less ready for school to already be showing inequitable outcomes by the time they're four and a half. But actually not every child who is exposed to that clustering of poverty will have a poor outcome. In fact, we can see on this slide that two out of three of the children, or more, nearly three out of four, in fact, actually don't have a problem with obesity by four and a half, despite having experienced these adverse conditions. So what we then did is say, well, what is it that is different about these children? And we went beyond the risk factors. So it's easy to look at the easy solutions. Yes, they're living in poverty. Yes, their housing is poor. Yes, we must do something about those things. But what else is going on? What is creating resilience in the face of this adversity? So we worked with the communities where that adversity is greatest. We worked with South Auckland, where 1,200 of our 6,800 children are growing up. 
We took the information that the collective voices from the cohort had brought to our attention, and we went to those communities and we said, let's look at this the other way around. What things are balancing out those risk factors that, yes, we must attend to? What else can we do in the meantime to try and help all our children to thrive, to do well, to reduce some of the inequities that are starting early in life? And we found some of the things that actually your grandmother might have been able to tell you about, or certainly mine did. Things like spending time, quality time with your children, having protected time to be with your child, having support in your community, having loving relationships around you. Things that seem really straightforward, but are not so easy for people who are living chaotic lives, lives that are challenged. So working with other groups, again, in partnership, developed this community initiative where spaces and libraries are no longer quiet spaces in South Auckland for young children. They are places where young mums, young parents, young families can gather with their children and actually spend that quality time and interact with others. Others can come to them so that these most vulnerable people are not needing to go out and to find all the solutions for themselves. People can come to them. And we're just evaluating whether that works. But I think the key thing in that is that partnership approach, listening to those voices of the vulnerable, listening to, in this case, a group of families, but it could equally be the person sitting in front of you in a clinical situation, and understanding that actually health is shaped by much more than just the biology or the virus or the bacteria or the certain conditions that exist proximal to the particular visit or the, the encounter that we have with that patient at that point in time and go much beyond that to understand what we can actually do by listening and putting ourselves in the shoes of those people that we are trying to serve. And Sir Michael Marmot put it much better than I can, and we heard about him this morning. He said, population health was much too important to leave just to doctors. And I think he's right. We need to actually work as doctors collectively, but we need to work outside of the health field as well, because so much of what happens to be health outcomes and inequities in health outcomes, as we've seen in some of the earlier slides, is so much driven by what's going on in the social and the economic context. So I just want to conclude with always acknowledging that it is really always my privilege to bring the voices of these nearly 7,000 families and children to the table, and I really want their voices to be able to make a difference. And I hope that sharing a little of their journey and their collective stories can help to inform some of the ways that you think about your practice as well. Um, and I'm always remembered that we stand on the shoulders of giants, in this case, uh, the wonderful Dame Fina Cooper, who died some 25 years ago now, but whose words are still profound. That, you know, we need to take care of our children because they are us in the future. Thanks for listening. <laughs>